This is Think Tech Research in Manoa. I'm Jay Fidel, and with me is Dave Carl, who is the director of the Center for Microbial Research, Microbial Oceanography Research and Education at UH Manoa. He is one of Think Tech's oldest friends, and I don't mean that necessarily in age, but he's been with us for the longest times, almost since we began. He's been with us and uh, part of us and helping us. Thank you so much for that, and thank you for coming down, Dave. Well, Jay, it's always a pleasure to come down to the studios here at Pioneer Plaza to talk story with you. Dave is the director of Think Tech Hawaii, which is really something for us. Uh, Dave is a member of the National Academy of Science, which is something for everyone. I mean, that, that is an important part of, of UH's you know, role in the landscape of science. Well, I've, uh, I've been very fortunate to be uh, here at UH for 41 years. Uh, I came with uh, nothing but a PhD in my pocket, and I've been able to build a program through collaborations and support from the federal government and private foundations, and a little bit of luck. And that was um, 30 years ago, and that was the beginning of the Hawaii Ocean Time Series, which is... Uh, uh, microbial oceanography research out there, what, uh, 100 kilometers north of these islands? Yeah, the Hawaii Ocean Time Series uh, is one of the collaborative programs that we started uh, around 1988. Uh, it's a field-based program, and behind me you can see uh, an image of the ship that we're currently using. This is the, the flagship of the UH Manoa fleet called the RV Kila Moana. It's a Navy-owned, uh, UH-operated research vessel uh, that just left uh, Pier 35 at 9 o'clock this morning uh, on its way to Station Aloha on its uh, 311th mission uh, in the last uh, 31 years. It's a lot. Because a mission is not just overnight. A mission lasts for several weeks, no? Well, a mission nowadays is four days. So we leave uh, the port of Honolulu. We have a beautiful marine facility at, at Pier 35. You're welcome to come down and visit. Maybe we can take a, a walking tour of that for your viewers. Uh -huh. uh, and it's, uh, it's our support uh, facility. We have um, personnel uh, stationed down there. We have beautiful laboratories. Uh, and then we have the research vessel, which is really our access to the sea. Now, th this research vessel uh, can carry 26 scientists and a crew. So it's a very large ship. It's very capable. Uh, you can see from the design uh, behind me that it's a swath vessel. It's a very unusual type of uh, a design. It's a small water plane area twin hull, acronym SWATH. And instead of having one hull like a typical ship would have, this has two hulls. And as a result, it's very stable in very high sea states. And, and you that want makes that for a, science. You want that for science. We take delicate instrumentation out to sea with us. Uh, laser-based instruments that need very fine alignment. Uh, we take a lot of electronic equipment with us, and all of this needs to perform well under the uh, oftentimes inclement weather at Station Aloha. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who, who don't go to sea and just maybe go to Waikiki and look out at the beautiful, uh, calm Pacific Ocean, Pacific actually means calm, and when Balboa named it, he was there at the Isthmus of Panama and looked out and Everything looked really calm, so he said, wow, this is a, a very Pacific Ocean. Uh, but in fact, uh, once you get away from the sh uh, shelter of the island, which is only about five or six uh, kilometers, if you go south of the islands, you'll be outside of the, the shelter of the, of the mountains, and then you get the full force of the trade winds, which oftentimes at Aloha blows 20, 30 knots and with uh, you know, five, six, seven-foot seas. We have to study with you what, uh, what the uh, time series does and what science is out there. And what, um, what Station Aloha has taught you all these years, because these 30 years have been, you know, um, have been a way to look at climate change, a way to see how the ocean and the marine life changes with climate change. So uh, after we present you with this award here, we're going to do that now. Okay. <laughs> We're going to want to know more about what you've okay. been doing out at Station Aloha. Fantastic. Okay. So December 5th was a significant day. December 5th, uh, 2018. That was the Think Tech uh, end of year party and awards program. Um, and uh, one of the awardees uh, was, the, was Seymour and you. 
And uh, we, we uh, have an award here that I want to sort of re-present to you because you weren't there. You were in Washington New raising York, money <laughs> for research. New York. <laughs> New York, sorry. Okay, so while you were away, we, we were presenting this uh, to, well, we were holding it for you. Uh, this is uh, an award uh, from Think Tech Hawaii 2018 for community service presented to the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education at UH Manoa. And I'll read the text. It's not very long. For outstanding service to science at the University of Hawaii for more than 30 years, advancing scientific research in microbial oceanography in projects involving microorganisms, molecular biology, and global ecology, and through the Hawaiian Ocean Time Series at Station Aloha. And it's signed by me and our Executive Vice President, Carol Mun Lee, Honolulu, December 5th, 2018. Dave, I want to present this to you now here live on ThinkTech. Well, thank you so much, Jay. This is quite an honor. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, our relationship goes uh, way back to the, to the formation of, of your great uh, gig here at Think Tech Hawaii, and uh, I'm very proud to be part of it, be a, uh, an underwriter and uh, a, a member of your board. So uh, I will display this in our beautiful Seymour Holly, and uh, occasionally we'll take it out to Station Aloha. Oh, that'd and, be great. Um, uh, show it to the crew members because yeah. they yeah. are uh, uh, part of our collaboration as well as all the scientists uh, shoreside at, at the uh, UH Manoa campus. And I'm, I'm really sorry to have missed the holiday party, but it fell exactly on top of our annual meeting for the um, Simons Collaboration on Ocean Processes in Ecology, the so-called SCOPE program, uh, which is uh, a program uh, funded by Jim Simons and the Simons Foundation in New York City. And we have an annual science meeting, so we were there talking about all of these things that we're going to be talking about uh, in a few minutes. And, uh, well, I guess I can only say it's uh, better late than never, uh, <laughs> but never late is better. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I, I'd like you to describe the relationship between, uh, you know, Seymour and Scope um, and, and tell people how it works in science to fund these projects, to fund this research, and what you have to do, you as a, an academician, as a researcher, um, as the director of the center, what do you have to do to keep it going and how you arrange the fundraising? Yeah, well, well, my particular position at the University of Hawaii is one of professor of oceanography. Uh, I'm fortunate to have state support for, my, uh, for nine months of my salary, and the rest of the, the year is... Uh, funded by uh, writing grants and, and getting private sources of money, whether that be from the National Science Foundation or from uh, private philanthropic organizations, in my case. And uh, so when I came here in March of, uh, I came at the end of March in 1978, and I immediately wrote a grant proposal because that's what young scientists need to do. And fortunately, my first uh, proposal ever was funded for 4000 Nine hundred dollars for a three-year program. Today. For a three-year program, and wow. now most uh, uh, initial grants are thousands, of, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more, because the cost of doing research is very high. So, for the first uh, decade at UH, I was uh, operating in the mode of a single investigator. By that, I mean I was uh, building my own lab. I had my own students, postdocs, and uh, technicians that I supported off my own grants. And there was a, a, what I would call a sea change in, in 1988, and that is when we proposed to the National Science Foundation the creation of, of the Hawaii Ocean Time Series program that you just mentioned. And this was a very different kind of program because it was one built on collaborations. Uh, we had several different principal investigators at UH. Roger Lucas, a physical oceanographer, and myself were the inaugural PIs, but we quickly... Um, uh, invited others to join. We, we ended up with five or six different investigators, all bringing in different skill sets, different intellects. They would bring in their labs, so the, the, the total number of people involved in the program uh, grew exponentially. And this makes science a lot more fun, and it makes it more productive, and it makes it more creative. So we've been doing this now for 31 years. And uh, 20 years into the HOP program, there was an opportunity 
that the National Science Foundation advertised on their website uh, for people to create um, proposals that would fund what's called centers of excellence. And uh, that, uh, you know, we were very attracted to that concept because we thought that we had created a, an initial collaboration, five or six people, that could easily be scaled up to a, a much larger and, and even more exciting, dynamic, and uh, successful and important scientific program. So we proposed the, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, the acronym CMOR. And that program was really built on the successes over the first uh, 20 years of the Hawaii Ocean Time Series program. We wanted to do more. We wanted to bring in more different uh, themes, research themes. We wanted to expand the number of people involved. And we did this by inviting uh, six different institutions from around the nation. Uh, Columbia University, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, the University of California, Oregon State University, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. These are top uh, research universities in the nation, but the leadership was here at UH. And uh, that, we, so that puts UH way up It put UH high uh, literally on the map, I think, for yeah. this uh, particular discipline. And after uh, five years of um, doing the, the Seymour program, which was nominally a 10-year program, these centers of excellence are supposed to be accelerator programs. And the idea is that after 10 years of federal funding, that maybe somebody else would step up and support these uh, uh, forever, maybe, or, or at least for another decade or so. Uh, so after five years, we were already thinking about follow-on programs. What are we going to do at the end? Um, and uh, we went to the UH administration at the time, and uh, it, it, we got very favorable feedback about building a new building, uh, Seymour Halle, and that's shown uh, behind us on the screen as well, mm -hmm. along with the research vessel. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were able to uh, raise the money through the sale of uh, revenue bonds. The university, of course, organized the, the bond sale. But the point there is that we had immediate money to build the building. And this is a very different model than most of the buildings on the UH campus, which are uh, through the CIP budgets of, of the university. So the deal with, with building this building is that the revenue stream would be grants and contracts and proposals and that we would create a learning center. We would create a, a center of excellence that would be self-sustaining, uh, at least for the payment of the bond uh, interest. And we would have to raise uh, five or six million dollars a year in extramural funds to do this. So it was no trivial matter. And, and of course, if, if I retired or, or, or failed, or worse, uh, at a motorcycle accident, let's say, or something like that, <laughs> and couldn't uh, achieve this, then the space would probably be reassigned to some other more productive unit on campus, as it should be. Well, we've ha we have been successful. The 10-year center hiatus came and went, and we were worried about a follow-on program. And as I said, we were able to, to get support from the Simons Foundation for even a larger program than uh, Seymour. So we now have a program called SCOPE, the, the center uh, the, the Simons Collaboration on Ocean Processes and Ecology. It's again a very large collaboration, this time with 16 institutions, not just across the nation, but around the world. And uh, we do collaborative research at Station Aloha. So over the course of these three programs, the, the Hawaii Ocean Time Series, which is ongoing and has been for 31 years, Seymour, uh, which was a 10-year program funded by the State of Hawaii and by the National Science Foundation, and now the Simons Collaboration, which is a nominally a 10-year program, but could go on longer, we hope. Uh, we've brought in an aggregate of well over $150 million to support oh, oceanographic geez. research in the state of Hawaii. And this helps with the general economy, but it, it's more than just the money. It's really the knowledge gained, uh, the discoveries made, and the predictions we can make about the future as we're facing up to things like uh, climate variability and climate change. Mm -hmm. We've been uh, out to the Center for Microbial uh, Oceanography uh, Research and Education. In fact, we made an OC16 movie, I, I, I hope you recall. And we walked around, we saw the center. It's really beautiful. It's, and you designed it, didn't you? Well, I, I helped. Yeah. You helped, okay. It's really a beautiful b building. It's, it's uh, let's see, it's right, right near the East-West Center, yeah. down East-West Center Road. Yes. A lovely, a lovely place. 
Um, and if you want to see that movie, you, you can. You can uh, go on uh, our site, uh, look up Seymour on our site, or on YouTube, our YouTube channel, and you can see that OC16 movie. We're going to take a short break now. And we, when we come back, we're going to unpack some of the other things that uh, Dave has been talking about, especially the collaboration model, which is so important. We'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. We're back with Dave Carl, researcher extraordinaire and the director of the Center for Microbial Oceanography, Research and Education and Scope um, at uh, UH Manoa. Uh, so one of the things Dave was talking about, and which we, Dave and I were talking about before the show, is the model of collaboration. And I'm so interested in that because last night I was watching on Netflix a movie about the, the, the Mayo Clinic, which distinguishes itself from uh, medicine as it is otherwise practiced in this country and many countries. Um, because it has a completely collaborative model where um, you can put uh, uh, specialists together, and when you put them all together, you can have the benefit of all of their collective knowledge. Um, this is very special in medicine, but it's also special in science. Well, you might say uh, we are the Mayo Clinic of the ocean. <laughs> uh, Scope and Seymour, and in fact, uh, the Hawaii Ocean Time Series program, were all founded on that same basic principle that. Uh, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts when you collaborate in science. I don't think there's any question about that. It, it, collaborative science is not for everybody, uh, but it certainly is for me. Uh, I was trained at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in La Jolla, California. And when I was a graduate student, I was part of a collaborative research effort funded by the Department of Energy called the Food Chain Research Group, where we had, we were trying to understand the marine food chain or what we now call the marine food web, this very complicated, complex interaction of phytoplankton, zooplankton, fish, viruses, bacteria. And uh, we were just getting the very basics of that when I was a grad student in the 1970s. But it took, uh, it took a village, as Hillary Clinton would say, to really attack these great problems of, of ocean science. So this collaboration was one of the few at the time, uh, and ever, in the field of plankton biology, the so-called food chain research group. So I always wanted to build my own career uh, around that same model. Uh, early on in my career, I did a lot of research in Antarctica. I went 23 times to Antarctica. And believe me, when you go to Antarctica, you don't want to be alone. You want to be with other people. You want to be collaborating. You want to be helping each other because it's a not only difficult science, but it's a rugged environment. And so you always need people around for, for safety reasons as well. It's not unlike going to sea. Uh, when you go to sea, you, you're, you're out there 24-7, so uh, it's not, a, it's not a, um, a job where you punch a clock and then go to your room and watch movies or something. You're always busy. If you're not busy doing your own work, uh, you're, you're looking to help somebody else. And there's always uh, things that, that need help. Uh, it's uh, water sampling and water processing. Uh, it's equipment that might break that needs repair out at sea. It's keeping underway systems operating properly and efficiently. It's sending data back to, back to shore. When we're out at Station Aloha, 100 kilometers due north of Kahuku Point, we are constantly sending data back to shore, even from the ship, where we're, people ashore are processing those data sets and sending initial results back to the ships so that we can tune our experiments or 
or, or do new experiments, uh, use that as, as, uh, uh, to build on the knowledge gain. So it's, it's a lot of fun to go to sea. I know you're an old Coast Guard guy. You probably have been to sea in your career, and it's, it's just a, it's a thrill to be at sea. Yeah, especially when you're doing science and trying to understand the sea around you. So, um, you know, you've learned a lot about the sea, but the sea has also changed in these 30 years. The microbial structure of the sea, the, um, the composition of the ocean, uh, the effect of uh, climate change. Uh, can you talk about the kinds of experiments you've been doing and the kinds of lessons you've learned scientifically? Yeah, well, our um, program, the Hawaii Ocean Time Series program, was founded on the principle that one needs to look at a complex environment like the North Pacific subtropical gyre for a fairly long period of time in order to separate the natural variability that occurs in all natural ecosystems from uh, systematic or secular change, uh, whether it's due to uh, anthropogenic forcing or not. So we had designed the experiment to last for at least 10 years. We thought that would be the time scale needed to start to see, um, to certainly map the, the climatology of station aloha. By that I mean how it changes uh, season to season. And after doing 10 years, you might have a good constraint on what the expectation is for the seasonal change. So that if you see a very unusual year or you start seeing a couple years in a row that fall outside of this, uh, these bounds, then you can uh, start thinking more seriously about what impacts you're observing. Now, some of the things we've seen at Station Aloha that were uh, predictable but never before seen uh, in the ocean is the uh, CO2 in the atmosphere we know is building up from fossil fuel burning and cement manufacturing and just uh, various industries around the globe. It scales on the, uh, on the world domestic production, and it scales on human population. There should be no surprise about that. If you plot human population, when uh, my birth year, there were 2.5 billion people on the planet. Now there's more than 7 billion and counting. Well, with all of those people comes more resource use and more byproducts, including carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide has been building up in our atmosphere. We've known that uh, for nearly 50 years or more, but we've never really looked carefully at the ocean to see how the ocean is uh, responding to that. So work done at Station Aloha and at our sister station in Bermuda, the Bermuda Atlantic Time Series Program, which was started on the exact same day, really? uh, the 30th of October, oh 1988. Oh, we wow. wrote the proposals together. We made the proposals to NSF together. We got funded together, and we've been continuing the research together. But at both oceans, the Atlantic Ocean for Bermuda and the Pacific Ocean for Hawaii, we can now see that the oceans have absorbed a lot of the CO2 from the atmosphere. So that is a buffer for the atmosphere. If it wasn't for the oceans, there'd be even more CO2 uh, in the atmosphere, and the, 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 the um, continents would even be warmer, and we'd be suffering from larger storms. Uh, but the ocean has absorbed a lot of the carbon dioxide, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the carbon dioxide that humans have released to the atmosphere has been absorbed globally by the oceans. But with that comes a change in the ocean, a very fundamental change uh, called ocean acidification. And I know you've had Chris Sabine on your show, and Chris is an expert on ocean acidification and on what we call anthropogenic carbon dioxide, which is the carbon dioxide that humankind is putting into the atmosphere. But suffice it to say that the ocean is becoming more acidic. At some point, it might reach a, a stage of acidity where certain kinds of plants can't grow anymore. They can't photosynthesize. That would be a, a devastating consequence for the whole food web. We might get uh, um, extinctions. So that would probably be predicted uh, under conditions of both uh, surface ocean warming and uh, acidification. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, this United Nations organization to look at the state of our planet, was founded, uh, interestingly enough, the same year that we founded Station Aloha, 1988. They, they were totally unrelated events, but it took uh, more than 25 years before the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change realized that the oceans should also be something that we should pay attention to. Most of their work before that was dealt with uh, land use and, and uh, uh, land 
a management, which because that's where people live. People don't live on or in the ocean. So it was kind of uh, Mara Incognita, I call it, the, the invisible <laughs> sea, the one that a cryptic ocean that, that we don't know much about, and that's yeah. still the case. But I was uh, fortunate to be a member of the IPCC 2014, what they call the Annual Assessment 5. So this was the fifth of the assessments that they've made about the state of our planet. And only in the Assessment re uh, Report 5 did we have two chapters on the oceans, one of which I co-authored with a German colleague, and the other was co-authored uh, by some other scientists uh, from foreign countries. So we were able to set up a baseline for what the oceans looked like circa 2014. And future assessment reports will compare the state of the ocean to our baseline mm. study. But as I said, this is a long-term process. It might take 30, 40, 50 years to start seeing really global effects of, of um, the deterioration of the ocean. The trouble is, once we see it, it can never be stopped. It's, it's like moving a big ship through the ocean. You can imagine a huge container ship, one of the Matson ships or something, and then a small kayak in front of it. Forget it. The kayak has no hope of that big ship stopping in time because it's got so much momentum. It's the same thing with the climate system. We're building the momentum of the climate system day after day, and we're not doing anything to ameliorate the problem. Sooner or later, it's going to reach a threshold. It's going to reach some tipping point where there will be some catastrophic effect. And then people will start paying attention and say, oh, we have to stop doing X, Y, or Z. And I'm sorry, it will be way too late for that. That we huge ship to, is on the way. The huge ship is it. moving toward yeah. us. And yeah. there's so much at stake here. And the governments of the world need to pay attention to this. Some are doing it more carefully than others. I'm sad to say that the U.S. is, is uh, lagging behind in our ability to... Um, Think about these uh, pending problems, and I know there's very active groups at UH and, and in the state government. Uh, Hawaii is one of the more progressive states with regard to climate change. They have a, a climate commission, and uh, the mayor has a climate commission, and uh, some other states. Uh, California is very progressive, as you know, but our federal government is really not responding mm. as they should. Mm. Well, but you know, this way we can know how fast the ship is moving. Um, and how pervasive these processes are, um, and, and, and thus raise public awareness about the need to take steps to work, work on climate change, to do things to slow it down. Uh, and that's, that's a sort of a side benefit of what you and, and other researchers at UH are doing. UH is a leader in this area, evaluating the ocean and the environment for climate change. No? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And you touched on a very important thing, Jay, uh, the public policy and public awareness. And scientists are not the best advocates for the work that they do. Uh, it takes a, a village again. It takes uh, skilled professional uh, journalists. It takes communications experts. And s some scientists who can do all of those things are leading the charge uh, because the general public, I think, has a, a fair appreciation for scientists, but they don't know what they do. I mean, if you... If you uh, rate uh, the, you know, how the public feels about various prof professions, scientists are always up there. But if you ask the general public, well, can you name a scientist? They can't. The National Academy did a, conducted a survey of this, and 50% of the general public could not even name one scientist. And then they lessened the question. They said, well, the person doesn't have to be alive, just any scientist in the history of humankind. <laughs> and still... 40% of the general population could not name an Einstein or a Pasteur. You know, it's all changed, though, Dave. It's all changed because now they can name a scientist. It's Dave Carl, <laughs> <laughs> the, director of the, the director of the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education and Scope at UH Manoa. Dave, I, I, we're going to come back. We're going to talk to you some more. We're going to visit the Kilimahana. We're going to visit uh, the center again. Um, we're going to make some movies about this to help you, and you can help us raise public awareness. And the other thing is, make sure you take your award with you today and hang it up in an appropriate place, either in the center or on the ship, okay? Thank you very much, Jay. And, and as the uh, slogan for Think Tech Hawaii goes, each day better. Yes, absolutely. 
Thank you very much, Dave.